I used to love school closing days. There was such a spectacle. We could go to school with home clothes. I remember carrying snacks, more snacks than I could finish alone. I would go sit down with my buddies and share our spread. I would trade my crisps for some friends' popcorns, give out some queen cakes to get a lollipop that my mom always seemed to forget to pack for me, or maybe refuse to buy. Do you remember those colorful, wow, little round corn puff rings? I would put one on each finger and eat them one by one, taking in all the sugar and absolute giddiness for leaving the demanding schedule of school to relish in the freestyle vibes of the school holiday. There would be no more early mornings, no more homework, no more crappy school food, no more teachers, and the fear that one wrong move will have your little ass whipped. Being home without school meant that I could sleep in a little, watch cartoons, and spend all day outside playing with my ACH homies. This was every kid's idea of bliss. At least it was mine. This is the first episode in a series that I'm calling The Holiday Survival Guide, a series of episodes that will explore various topics, situations, or scenarios that tend to come up during the holidays, and more specifically, during this end of year season. This is Mama Tales, a podcast that celebrates our collective motherhood journey. I'm your host, Sally Kuria. For this first part of the series, we're going to get into what to do with our kids during this long break. For many parents in Kenya, specifically those whose kids are enrolled in a government-led CBC curriculum, this year's third term holiday is 10 weeks long. Other kids in different curriculums might get lesser weeks, but parents all around the country will be plagued with one major question. What will my kids do all day? What's the best use of their time? I think parents find themselves asking these questions because they want what's best for their kids. When their kids are in school, they know that they're learning something new. Their progress is tracked, there's a schedule to follow, and there are certain expectations at the end of the day. Holidays bring with them less structure, and their responsibility falls back on the parents, many of whom might panic on how best to fill this time. To help me answer this question, I had a chat with a woman who has committed her life to kids and their development. Okay, so I'm Danielle Ochieng. I keep saying I'm passionate about everything that comes to children. I currently work as a curriculum designer, but also a child and adolescent psychologist. I think back from when my mom tells me of uh, when my love for kids started, I think I was about six or five. Okay, so all my dolls were, like, I, I was not that average girl like with dolls. My dolls were bathed, they were washed, I read for them stories. And then when my mom's friend had a baby, I remember asking if I can carry it. And weirdly enough, they trusted me with, with the baby. Uh, and I stood, I was carrying the baby and I was standing, but at five, six, you really don't know how to hold a kid. So I was holding her by the legs and she fell backwards. So... But imagine, I was five, so the distance between me and the ground wasn't that much. And she fell on the carpet. And weirdly enough, they didn't scream. None of them shouted at me or said anything. They just told me, you know what, just sit down. You know, like, you know, you're pushed to the back of the sofa because you're really tiny. So your legs are like all across and just giving the baby again. And I feel like that's just been it for me. Because I, even when I was in boarding in primary, around class seven, class eight, we had up to class threes in boarding. So the times I was like free, I'd go to their classes, you know, just to hang around them, play them. Went through high school. And then I realized I really, really love being around children. I love being a support for kids. I love kids feeling loved. Since then, Danielle has had a lot of experience working with different types of kids. Kids from wealthy, privileged backgrounds to kids who have very little I don't know if there's anything that has stood out to her as an important piece for every child's development. Um, children need love um, and quality time. You know, parents are like, oh, we're all busy or maybe I'm a single mom or we're both working. It has nothing to do with spending. You may be with your child for seven hours and they don't feel it, but you may have just 10 minutes with them and it makes a huge impact. The one thing 
I tell parents is the most important thing is your child needs to know that you love them and you care for them. And that solves a multitude, multitude of problems, whether it's their self-esteem um, and also realizing that a kid's self-esteem also doesn't come from the fact that, oh, you tell them, oh, you're the smartest, you're the most beautiful, you're the all this. No, no, no. It first of all comes with the, so if like parents, there are two parents together, the relationship they see with the parents, how they treat each other, and also how you treat the child. It has very little with what you say. That's why you can find the smartest people with the lowest self-esteem or the richest people with the lowest self-esteem. So yeah, so for me, it's love. Love, um, I, I love the song, which cartoon was this? I just say love, 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 makes the world go round. So yeah, that's, that's what I would say. For me, kids need the most. As Danielle said, spending quality time with our kids is crucial for their well-being. But this can get challenging for a lot of parents, especially for full-time parents who leave home really early in the morning and come home really late and end up missing most of the time the kids are awake and active. Sometimes the weekend rolls around and all we want to do is rest. How then can we find that crucial time to spend with our kids? I think the first thing I'll tell parents, and especially mothers, because I think I get it a lot from mothers, is you've kept your child alive this far, you're doing a great job. <laughs> it's it's harder than you ac- they actually think it is. Um, but when it comes to quality time, and I like that you brought the aspect of you're working hard to get your kids like the best that there is. And I think we need to decide what best is. Um, I also have a background in education. So like my undergrad was in early childhood education and my master's was in counseling psychology so i focused on children and adolescents but you hey you don't your child doesn't let me not mention a school but your child doesn't have to go to a school <laughs> worth three hundred thousand to get a good education right because every parent is thinking no uh, my kid needs to go to this kind of school and you take them to that school but at what um risk or what are you going to let go? That's the time you're spending with your kid. There's very good schools that I know that are 30, 40,000, 50, even 20, you know, depending on the parents' budget that can just provide as well of education. And your kids don't need, okay, this is now having interacted with a lot of kids and teenagers and both across the spectrum from the really wealthy to those who have close to nothing. Um, what you end up finding is the needs of children are the same, right? You may, you give your kids everything, you know, what's the point for the Christians? Gain the whole world and lose your soul. And it's the same thing with your kids. You give your kids everything and you end up losing your child. And then you, they grow up into teens and now it's rehab, it's suspensions, it's all this kind of thing. So for me, I would say finding that balance and you don't have to, and this is also coming from a part, there's a lot of single parents, not even just mothers, but a lot of single parents out there who are struggling to give the best for their kids. You don't have to spend 10 hours with your kid a day to feel like you're great. You're doing great. Or three hours. It could be a weekend or the time you come from work, you know, or a, yeah, mostly we can, you can find time during the week, right? To just sit with your kid, regardless of the age, um, whether they're teenagers or small children but just to find out how their day was, read a story with them and be as dramatic as possible. I also love literacy when it comes to kids. So use the voices and, you know, ask your kid to dramatize it. If you can just take 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes a day to speak with your child, you know, just find out how their day was um, because this is where you find, I hope I'm not going a bit too deep, but this is where you find a lot of things happening to children that parents don't know. And having dealt with kids and teens who've gone through um, sexual abuse right under the noses of their parents and mostly because you don't notice, right? You're busy and your five-year-old has been walking weirdly, you know, or they have some rashes um, around their private. You don't know about it because it's the nanny who's showering them or somebody else who's taking care of them. And you'll have these kids grow up with stories that, oh, no, no, my parents gave me everything, but, you know, I was being abused under their nose. So it's, yes, you want to give everything, but just find time to get to know who your child is. That's why, like, even having been 
previously in the classroom a couple of years ago for I think it was in the classroom for about six seven years is where you know when a child does something and you call the parent and like that's not my child i'm like you don't you, you say because you don't know your child right um and then when they get to teenagehood when it's a bit too late or into the young adults where it's suddenly what do i do now you know daniel come talk to my child and i'm like we tried when they were five what do you want me to do when they're 18 you know it, it's a much um longer process when it comes to that so just say for points like just try and squeeze 10 15 minutes with you with your kid with intentionality we can find the time to be with them especially when they're on break there is room to organize their day in a way that enriches both of you okay i think let me start with first of all the for the school choice one um so maybe to clarify i'm not saying you take your child to the worst school because you got these things you have to check out in a school right you need to make sure they genuinely care about the kids the, for me like learning to read is very important but it's not the first thing i would check i wouldn't check their kcp results first right i'll check what's the behavior of the children how do the teachers approach uh, behavior what's the collaboration between parents and teachers so there's things you need to check um based on uh what you're looking for for your kid there's things that are more important education is very important first of all as an educator it's a very important thing but there's life skills that cannot be taught in the classroom that are most important when you're checking for school for your kids so i'd say that and then now for the holidays and keeping kids busy i don't know how to say this but parents need to stop feeling the need to over engage their kids kids need to get bored yes your kids need to get bored and they need to learn to figure out i know us growing up um we probably we did have a tv but back then is when it was those big tvs with the big behinds right and a lot of things before cartoons so many cartoons came you only had one switch and the rest is go and play outside like i would encourage parents to let kids play outside they have so much energy that needs to be let go of and i think also that's back to the choice of school i personally would find a red flag if i had a child in grade three and below or especially like grade one and below and they come back with all their clothes clean no change of dirty clothes in the bag nothing it would be a red flag kids need to play and the the screen time i think this would also be tying into like the screen time um i've noticed over the last five seven years of being in the education field compared to when i started teaching about 10 years ago is that kids there's more attention deficit hyperactivity disorder a lot of kids are being diagnosed with you know being unable to calm down and a lot of kids are being put on medication which also now completely messes up their system and a lot of this comes from the fact that children are not being allowed to play right they're not outside screaming and playing and learning how to problem solve when they have an issue with one of their friends and the screen time also uh, this is a whole topic on its own but my undergrad research was on ch- children's media and if you see how the brain um functions when you're watching entertainment generally whether it's educational or not as long as it's something that's activating the mind mostly you'd find a lot of the prefrontal cortex which is like the reasoning a lot of it can switch off and then the limbic system goes on and then a lot of these scenes you'll have them instead of so generally like the cartoons we grew up with even though we didn't watch them that much it would take a while like when this guy was flying from one place you'd see it fly for a couple of seconds but you know this one it's like two seconds three seconds the scenes are easily changing are quickly changing and So what teaches the brain what that's teaching the brain is that things need to move really quickly. So when a child goes to school and the teacher is moving from point A to B and coloring takes point A to B like it's a normal they can't concentrate. So you'll end up finding this kid hyperactive because their brain is used to overstimulation which comes from too much screen time. Right and then it's worse if they have it below the age of 3 because the first 5 years is when the kids and especially 3 years when the kid minds like a sponge so by the time they get into school you're like oh my child can't sit down you know oh you know i don't know what's happening so do this do our kids got what vaccines and now they are all adhd a lot of it is just coming from uh, this fact that the screens and the cartoons that they're watching are too quick 
and they can't keep that up with normal life. So they become um, unsettled because they're trying to keep themselves moving up and down as the cartoons are. That's why I'm like, I would limit screen time even for kids above the age of three. So for keeping busy, if you have a place where kids are outside, and I know there's all this fear of kids being stolen or, you know, disappearing. If you have a safe place, let the children play outside. Let the kids run because then trying to keep them busy is what's stressing parents. Or um, the other day I was on a Facebook page and some mothers were asking, oh, what am I going to do with my kids for two months? You know, somebody give me a breakdown from morning to evening. And like even we didn't grow up with a breakdown of morning to evening because it's also not stressing you as a parent, right? They wake up, then they're going to, uh, let's say, eat their breakfast, then they're going to do activity one, then activity two. Like let kids be. And also, especially for the small ones, allowing them to be bored is part of the brain development. They'll figure out how to do things on their own and how to come up with activities to do on their own. And if you've worked with kids, um, one of my friends has a baby and the other day we had gone to visit him and parents also feel the need. Yes, good toys are great. You sh- Please buy for your kids toys. But if you see kids usually below the age of two, they want to play with your household items, not what you've bought them. And so what our friends had done is they had got him bottles, you know, like this juice and soda bottles, empty ones and tissue paper, tissue paper rolls and like what's it called like shoelaces and all he did was you know he'd arrange the bottles he'd try and count them he can't count because he's like one and a half but you'd try and see he's trying to make a formation he'd take the like the tissue rolls try and pile one on top of the other they would keep falling but he would keep trying and you see that's them also showing how the kid deals with frustration because if they're used to things being done for them all the time any small thing, they would scream and like throw everything away. So it's just like I just have parents like don't try to keep your kids too busy. If they need to play, let them go play outside. If you have, we shall go to take them. Let them go and feel the grass and you know the fresh air and the water. I mean, I think I'd mostly say that for kids that very small kids. I'm usually just concerned that kids are not playing enough. I fully understand and agree with the sentiments, but the idea of safety or finding a safe space for your kid to go out and explore is becoming much harder. At least that's how I feel. I know that when my daughter was young, I had to go out with her because we live in an apartment that didn't necessarily have a playground. The only available space was a car park and a section of grass that had open trenches. It was difficult to imagine leaving a two-year-old outside to play without my supervision. Being heavily pregnant also did not help. I had very little bandwidth to do it, so we ended up relying on screen time. We did eventually end up moving to a place that made me feel a little bit more comfortable with her outside without me, but I know that this lack of safe space is something that can hinder a lot of parents from letting their kids go play outside. I'm wondering, could this also come from the fact that as a society we've got more and more you know, this thing of, oh, no, me, I'm introvert. Oh, I don't like hanging around people. I don't like talking to people. And it's become more and more rampant. So could it be from the fact that, you know, because if I knew that new Bakumi, if I knew my neighbors, right, and like I knew, knew them, we don't have to be like deep friends, like, oh, let's come and let's hang out this weekend. But it's like, I know who my neighbor is. I know the mom. I know the children. It would, if we actually as parents to the initiative to know about each other, it was so much easier for me to know, oh, my my child is downstairs with Sally's child. They are good to go. You know, so I feel like also for parents is stop closing up. Yeah, just get to know your neighbors. You get to know them. You get to know their children, you know. As we continue chatting, I wanted to know if there's a case for structured time. I think a lot of parents see this time away from school as a good way to enroll our kids to programs to learn new stuff. Stuff like coding, gymnastics, swimming, football, music, or anything else that they might be interested in. 100 percent if you have the money like me when i get kids i i will i've worked with probably almost a thousand kids in my entire lifetime i don't have my own yet but 100 percent guaranteed great with kids um but when i do my my kids are doing gymnastics at least my girl is something i didn't get to do it's not imposing but so like at least when it comes to careers per se no when i'll just open it to the kids but i feel like if you do have 
that money, please do get your kids enrolled in something because this could be what helped them later on in life, right? You don't know where life would take them. And also could be with everything that's happening and sometimes maybe you're very busy, your kid is going through something, this could be an outlet for them, right? And it's also good skills. The, the thing about a lot of these activities beyond just you going and say, oh, my child is super flexible, oh, my child can play the harp or whatever. It's the skill of discipline comes in learning how to play that thing because you know you need to practice and practice and practice to get good, right? And these are skills that as much as they don't look part of the activity you're taking to your kid, it's a very important skill they gain there subconsciously because that means they also know later on in life or in other things that they're going to do, I need to practice if I need to go fail, um, need to get great at something or it needs, I need patience when it comes to this thing or I need to be able to ask for help because I get lost in this or I need to have grit when it comes to some of these things. So there's a lot of skills they gain aside from being able to do ballet or being being a good footballer. You know, you learn team playing through that so that you don't grow up thinking the world revolves around you. So I would say if you can, 100% to just don't feel your child's day from the time they wake up at 8 to the time they're going to sleep at 8 p.m. But 100%, if you can take your kids for different activities, please do. Yeah, strike a balance between structured and unstructured time. Before we ended our conversation, I asked if there's anything parents usually worry a lot about that they really shouldn't be. What your kids have versus what they don't have in terms of, you know, this kid, let's say, is, has this type of shoes and mine doesn't, or this kid's being dropped by a chopper in school and mine's using a school bus. I, I feel like a lot of the material things that are worrying parents when it comes to their children and giving to their kids is where I would say we tread a bit softly. And I know a lot of us are, it's like a trauma response. I didn't have, so I'm going to make sure my kid has, right? But I would say we have to find a way of balancing that. Get your kids the best you can, but I'll always say, please, not at the expense of your children's social and emotional health, which greatly comes from the interaction with you and those um, in the home. And another thing is someone's child is doing something and you expect your child to do the same. Like we hated being compared when we were small. Don't do that to your kid. So don't worry. So-and-so's child has walked at 11 months. Yours will walk at one and a half. And imagine when they all get to PP1, they're going to be doing the same race during sports day, right? Nothing is going to um, change about that. So I generally say a lot to do with where you're expecting your child to be and where they're currently at is just give it time. But generally, you're doing a great job. I think from a lot of the kids that I've interacted with or parents and you're stressed, you're doing a great job. Your kid is alive. You're taking care of them. They have the needs that they have. Um, maybe it's where I'd still push. And you'll always hear me saying, just love your kid and spend time with them. That's what I would insist on. But don't worry. Your, your kid will be fine. And also, if you you have your kids have cousins, it's very important. By the way, the kids I don't know how many studies have been done, but I've seen like two or three of how kids who grew up with like their cousins or you know like you know your friends' kids like they actually grow up more mentally stable than those who grew up in a silo. So try avoid keeping your kid at home too much and thinking it's just going to be you and your kid against the world let them actually interact with the world but generally you're doing well if your child's alive if they're speaking if they can communicate if they love you you know they, they look forward to seeing you every day you're doing great as a parent that's what i'd say that's it for this episode. I want to thank Danielle Oching for taking the time to speak with me. I believe her insights on this topic were valuable and very much needed. I also want to send a big thank you to Masi Mandela and Cynthia Anyango on sharing their plans on what they do with their kids during the holiday. I will play those clips in a little bit, so keep on listening to hear from them. They have all shared their stories on here before, so if you'd like to hear them, 
You can find them linked in the show notes of this episode. Next week, we will continue on with this series by looking at how kids who learn and develop differently handle the most times chaotic holiday season. Remember to check us out on Instagram and TikTok at Norma Tales Podcast and join our community by subscribing to the newsletter. Links to all of this can be found in the show notes of the episode as usual. Did you find this episode valuable to you? Share it with your friend or your entire circle and better yet, consider donating to the show to help me keep going. Your donation means a lot to me and I want to send a big, big shout out to everyone who's donated so far. Catch you in the next one. But before you go, listen to this. Hey, Masi Mandela here. I am a child of God, living and pursuing the purpose of God over my life. And I do that through different avenues, such as being a wife, a homeschooler, an author, an entrepreneur, a project manager. And as you can see, I wear very many hats. And for the purpose of this particular podcast, I am a mother. I have two sons, one who turned six recently. That's my first one. And the second one who turned four in July. So as I mentioned, I'm a homeschooler. So the first week of school break also means uh rather school break also means that i'm also on break as a homeschooler right as a teacher and so we take the first week to just wooza wooza and enjoy um being at home and enjoy not having school in the morning and things like those and then we also i encourage the kids now to like have um to plan their day so we usually have a lot of childhood activities that we do together at home and this can include anything from baking to cooking to science experiments art a lot of nature walks especially now that it's been raining they enjoy the muddy puddles uh, so we we'll go on walks and they'll be splashing on that or we'll be home cozying up making some nice warm banana bread or some cocoa for my younger one and some juice for my older one and so as you can tell we do a lot of things um at home and then also sometimes i usually host sensory and outdoor sessions where we can have other kids join us and this is usually very exciting to have other children come and join our world and enjoy the goodness that is learning through play um other things that we do is that we visit and we visit places we've enjoyed before or we find new ones which is always such a hit and as soon as we find a new one it becomes a place that the kids would want to go again and again and again uh, something else we do is we visit with family and friends and if you are at home then we'll also do things like um, at night we'll have like movie nights or we'll have like a date night or whatever and just enjoy um, our school break so mostly during school break it would be um, things we do at home and then things we do with, with friends or we ha- I host something and the kids get to enjoy with other kids and we bring in other kids to all our fun and goodness hello mama tells podcast so happy to be back on here my name is Cynthia Anyango also I am mama Ethan I am a program manager project manager product manager within the tech space. Um, I work with teams to deliver different types of products and when I'm not doing that I am busy with my six-year-old son Ethan. I am a single parent um, so that means that a lot of times I'm the one catering to my son. Of course with the help of the community that I have built around him my go-to plans for the holiday so i love school break because every time my son is up and has to go to the school i feel so bad for the poor thing i'm like i hope you feel um better and i feel you um, having to leave the blanket but luckily my son is usually (laughs) very happy to be up in the morning and love school so having him on Uh, School break means I get to hang out with him a lot because I work from home. Sometimes I notice that also my productivity goes down 
whenever he's on school break because I have to engage him. So um, in the morning we try and read, practice reading and do educational activities. Then he has 30 minutes of screen time depending on the day or he plays with the toys and majority of his time is actually spent outside playing with his friends. So in my living setting, there are about six kids and all of them are age men. So he refers to them as his siblings. So they're that close so they get to play together. Um, aside from that, um, if the weather permits, we go for swimming. And um, I'm, en- I'm enrolling him back to football so that he's also engaged and gets to build a community aside from from this one that he has at home. Um, the other thing that he gets to do is he visits his dad. And there I understand he also has friends and gets to hang out with them as well as now his other side of the family.